Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We, we honor your word. We reverence your word. And we thank you, Lord, that people's lives are literally changed through the power of your word. Open every heart tonight, keep away every distraction, and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm doing a series this weekend. That's usually what I like to do. I like to pick a subject and come at it from, I have four sessions, so I'll come at it from four different angles. Because I think that sometimes you've got to stay with something for a while to really get it. There are occasions where I'll come in and, do te and teach four different subjects, but that's very rare for me because I'm a teacher. I like to really get into things. So we're talking this weekend about confrontation. Most people don't like confrontation. Some people are petrified of confrontation. And the people who don't like it usually make excuses for not doing it by simply saying it's just hard for me to confront. Well, whoever said that you're not going to have to do some things in life that are hard for you? Just because something's hard, that doesn't mean that we just automatically get out of doing it. Now, I never had too many problems confronting people. Matter of fact, I was a little bit overly confrontational. <laughs> but I still had to learn how to confront fear, how to confront circumstances and situations in my life the way that Jesus would confront them and stand up to them. I had to learn how to confront the devil, and every once in a while, God will have to give me a little refresher course in confronting the devil and not letting him walk all over me and not listening to his lies. And, you know, there's a great deal that we have to learn as Christians, and I find that I never stop learning because sometimes you get kind of rusty in something and you have to go back and get a refresher course. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. So tonight we're going to do a message called, It's Time to Stop Running. It's time to stop running away from things and start confronting things. People run from all kinds of things. They run from places that are uncomfortable for them. They run from new things. They run from the past. People, some people run from responsibility. They don't want responsibility. A lot of the stuff that we have going on in our society today that is so despicable is simply because people don't want to be responsible. They don't want to take their responsibility. We need to have reverential fear and awe of God. People have forgotten how to fear God properly. God is God. He's not just your buddy. He means what He says. He says what He means. And the Bible teaches us one principle throughout, and that is, is that we reap what we sow. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap from the Spirit life and life eternal. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh ruin, decay, and destruction. God has a way for us to live. He calls them commandments, not suggestions, commandments. He says, I set before you life and death. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. We're partners with God. God has a part and we have a part. If we don't do our part, then we're not going to reap the benefit of the part that God does. The good thing about a relationship with God is even though He gives us a part to do, He also gives us the power to do it. So there's really no excuse. We have to be responsible. So many people are not responsible. They build up mountains of debt, and then when they're way over their head in debt, they just file bankruptcy and start all over again. It's not only for people, it's for businesses. And I'm not trying to put condemnation on anybody. There was a time in my life when I got myself in such a mess, I married the first guy that came along because I thought nobody would ever want me, and he ran up all kinds of bills, and he left me, and then they, they were trying to get, make me pay his bills, and he's still out charging stuff. And I actually had to file bankruptcy when I was like 19 years old. There are times when I don't think you have a choice. But the things that should be those rare, occasional things that people do when they really don't have any choice have become commonplace today. And we must stop living like that. We must be responsible and do what God asks us to do. 
Can anybody do something besides stare at me like a calf at a new gate? <laughs> you probably won't like this, and I know this doesn't suit, fit everybody here. I don't mean it insultingly, but when I was coming over here tonight, I said, I hope God sends me a whole bunch of people that have been Christians for about 15 or 20 years, and they're still in diapers and got their pacifier. Because <laughs> I'm going to cut loose tonight. Amen. <laughs> and the only way that happens is if we have the meat of the word. I'm not a dessert preacher, as you know. God will send somebody in later to bandage up your wounds, but I'm going to whip up on you a little bit tonight. Amen. <laughs> People run from responsibility. People run from hard work. They run from hard things. They run from difficult places. They run from their own sin. They run from themselves. They run from the truth. <laughs> Some people spend their whole life running. Now, tomorrow morning, I'm going to teach you six specific, very practical ways that we run from things. The only way we run from things is not just to start running physically. There are people who run away physically and actually leave things that God would prefer that they stay and confront and work through. But there's many, many, many ways that we avoid and evade. And I want you to be confrontational people who will no longer run from anything because God does not want us to be afraid. He wants us to be bold and courageous, and He wants us to know that we can handle anything that comes our way that... I mean, my gosh, one scripture, 1 John 4, 4, just absolutely lights my fire. We have already defeated and overcome the agents of the Antichrist because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We don't have to fight with the devil. We just need to rem remind him who he is and who we are. And we need to be a little more confrontational and say, no, I'm not putting up with that. No, no, no. No. Instead, we just go, well, I just wish the devil would I tell you, sister, the devil's just on my back. I'm just under attack. I'm under attack. We went through a season of the body of Christ where everybody was under attack. We're just under attack, under attack. And God said to me one day, if you'd stay on the attack, you wouldn't be under the attack all the time. <laughs> and really what that means is you just need to live with a little more oomph, a little more Holy Ghost oomph, you know, just like... I am God's child, and I'm not going to be walked all over all my life. I am the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. I will not live in fear. I will not run away from things because I can do whatever I need to do in life through Christ who strengthens me. You can do whatever you need to do. Dave and I got ourselves in debt one time with credit cards and we decided that that wasn't the way God wanted us to live, and we tore those things up. And for a year or two, we had to live very, 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 very lean and not buy hardly anything at all. When you've been excessive one way, the only way you can correct it is to now go and be excessive the other way. We had spent too much. When you use credit cards and you charge stuff up that you don't have the money to pay for, Nothing wrong with credit cards, I use them. But I don't use them to buy stuff I can't pay for. When you do that, you're spending tomorrow's prosperity today. Then when tomorrow comes, you don't have any money, so you gotta borrow on the next month, and the next year, and the next month, and the next year. Well, we did that just like many people do that, thinking we had to have everything right now, couldn't wait on anything. And then, because we had overspent here, then we had to come over here and spend a year or two not buying hardly anything at all, and we deserved it. And some of you deserve it too. Now, well, this is going to be more fun than I can stand, I can tell. My gosh. I don't know, Pastor, I may throw this to you in about 30 minutes and go sit down, huh? See, we need to have that attitude. I got myself in a mess doing dumb stuff. 
And there's no reason for me not to go through a few things to get myself out of it. We always want a miracle from God to undo everything that we've done. And God is not going to deliver you like that most of the time. Occasionally that happens, but most of the time he's going to make you walk it out because if we don't, we never learn a lesson and we go right back and do the same dumb thing all over again. <laughs> so we have to stop running. Let's look at what happened to people in the Bible who ran. Acts chapter 7, verse 20. God gave me this message back in the 90s, and I preach it every few years. It's been a few years again since I've preached this, and I'm looking forward to hearing it myself tonight. <laughs> I always tell people, if you don't need it, I'll just preach to myself. <laughs> Acts chapter 7, verse 20. At this juncture, Moses was born, and he was exceedingly beautiful in God's sight. And for three months he was nurtured in his father's house. And then when he was exposed to perish, the daughter of Pharaoh rescued him and took him and reared him as her own son. A wicked king had put out an edict that all the male children that were babies should be killed. And Moses' parents hid him. God had a destiny for Moses. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom and culture of the Egyptians, and he was mighty, powerful in his speech and in his deeds. And when he was in his 40th year, it came into his heart to visit his kinsmen, the children of Israel, to help them and to care for them. Moses had a good heart. He wanted to help people. And on seeing one of them being unjustly treated, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian and slaying him. Now, I want to just stop right here and say God never told him to do that. He kind of took that thing in his own hands. He wanted to help people. He wanted to see these hurting people delivered. But he didn't wait on God's ways and God's timing. God had a call on his life, but he had to have some brokenness in his life first. If you don't understand what brokenness is, you must learn. Brokenness is not an ugly, frightening word. To be broken in the right places is the most beautiful thing that can ever happen to you. Amen. Five people understand that word. <laughs> I'd get more shouts if I preached on miracles, but I'm going to do you a favor. And I'm going to preach on something that you can use in your life about a month from now when all hell breaks loose. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Verse 25, now I love this. He expected his brethren to understand that God was granting them deliverance by his hand, taking it for granted that they would accept him, but they did not understand. <laughs> I tell you what, when God called me back in 1976, to do what I'm doing, I expected people to be happy for me and cheer me on. I expected them to understand that God was calling me to help them. The only problem was they didn't want my help. <laughs> they weren't happy for me. They did not understand. And I got hurt very, very, very badly. But I can stand here and tell you today it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Everything don't have to feel good for it to be God. I said everything don't have to feel good for it to be God. We all want a resurrection, but I want to tell you that Friday comes before Sunday. That means there is no resurrection without a crucifixion. Well, my reputation got crucified back then. I had to take my reputation and get up on that cross with Jesus with it. And I had to die to caring about what people thought of me. And it was gut-wrenchingly hard. 
But we don't even begin to know what freedom is until we, until we come to a point in our life where we have no need to try to impress anyone. Did you hear what I said? We don't even begin to know what freedom is until we come to a place in our lives where we have no need to try to impress one another. That's when you're free. You're not trying to impress anybody. You're just trying to simply do what you believe that God is asking you to do. Amen. Verse 26, then on the next day, he suddenly appeared to some who were quarreling and fighting among themselves, and he urged them to make peace and become reconciled, saying, men, you're brethren. Why do you abuse and wrong one another? Whereupon the man who was abusing his neighbor pushed Moses aside, saying, who appointed you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you intend to slay me as you slew the Egyptian yesterday? At that reply, Moses sought safety by flight. That means he ran away. And he was an exile and an alien in the country of Midian, which happened to be in the wilderness. That means that he would have ran away from El Paso and ran and lived out here in the 300 miles of desert <laughs> where there's nothing. Now somewhere out there, he found a woman, got married and had a couple of kids. He had two sons and he lived out there 40 years. And the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about the particulars of what happened in those 40 years. Because sometimes when God is birthing something in us, it's just a private matter and too messy for anybody else to get into the details of. Amen? Amen. But nonetheless, after those 40 years was over, the Bible says that Moses was the most humble and the meekest man on the face of the earth. And what is even more hilarious is, is Moses wrote the book where that's written. <laughs> so I haven't figured that out yet, how you can be humble and meek and say you're humble and meek, but... <laughs> At that point, God called him to do what he tried to do 40 years before that, and now he didn't want anything to do with it. And God had to literally force him to go. But I want you to watch something that I think is just absolutely hysterical. Verse 30, and when 40 years had gone by, there appeared to him in the wilderness, the desert of Mount Sinai, an angel in the flame of a burning bush. And when Moses saw it, he was astonished and marveled at the sight. But when he went close to investigate, there came to him the voice of the Lord saying, I am the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses trembled and was so terrified that he did not venture to look. And the Lord said to him, Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground and worthy of veneration. Now watch this. Because I have most assuredly seen the abuse and the oppression of my people in Egypt, and I have heard their sighings and their groanings, I have come down to rescue them. So now come, and I will send you back to Egypt. Now here's my message, and I'm going to prove it to you. Anything you run from, <laughs> I don't care how many years you hide, sooner or later, you're going to have to go back and confront that thing and deal with that issue and deal with that mess that you left. Because if you don't, it will always be something that will harm your future, will aggravate you, will torment you, something the devil can use against you. And God wants us to confront issues and move beyond them. God never told Moses to run from Egypt. Moses ran. He did learn a lot out in the wilderness. It took 40 years, but who's to say that he couldn't have learned it faster if he would have stayed in Egypt? God is not calling us 
to run away. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but in the Bible, God gives us armor. In Ephesians 6, he gives us armor, armor. But all of it is for our front side. There's no armor for your backside. That's because God never expected you to be running from anything. He didn't think he would need to protect your backside. He gave you everything you needed for the front, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the sword, the shield of faith. And he wants you to go out like a soldier in the army of God and say, I will not fear, I will not run. We need to be like little David, the shepherd boy, when nobody would fight with Goliath. And it just embarrassed David that the Israelite army was acting so cowardly in front of this giant. And he said to Goliath, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? He knew that God was with him. And he went out with a slingshot and five stones. And he killed this giant. But I love what the Bible says. Goliath was bad-mouthing David. And David kept talking about the name of the Lord. You come to me with a sword, a javelin, and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And today, I'm going to cut your head off, and I'm going to feed your carcass to the birds of the earth. Because I come to you in the name of God. And he was this little, ruddy shepherd boy, not even really very old, still just a little bit beyond a teenager. But he knew his God. And when we know our God, we don't have to run from things. We know that we can stand up to things, and we can face things, and we can conquer things. And the Bible says that David looked at Goliath, and he ran quickly toward the battle line. He didn't run away. He ran quickly toward the fight. Sometimes we think things to death. We look at Goliath so long that he petrifies us. And then we run away. We need to learn how to live out of our spirit, know what God wants us to do, and just simply go do it. Amen. Amen. What was he running from? Well, he was running from being misunderstood. Nobody likes that. We all want to be understood. Women especially like to be understood. And sometimes, especially at that certain time of the month when they're kind of weird, <laughs> they want to be understood. And there's no man on earth that could understand that. <laughs> but I've told my husband, I don't care if you understand me or not, just tell me you do. <laughs> this is one time you can fib and it's okay. Just put your arm around me and say, honey, I understand. <laughs> it makes me feel better if I think he does even if he doesn't. Doesn't it make you feel better if somebody just says, I understand. I understand. Well, Moses thought they were going to understand, but they didn't. He ran from being rejected by the people that he wanted to help and the people he wanted to lead. He ran from confrontation with authority. He didn't want to face Pharaoh. He didn't want to face the authority in the palace. Many, many, many people have a fear of authority. And you need to not be afraid of anything because God is with you. Now, there are times when we should get away from things. There are times when we should run just as fast as we can run. But it shouldn't be because we decide to. It should be because God tells us to. And what we do is we run away from places where God wants us to stay, and we stay places where He wants us to get out of. Can anybody say amen? amen? Well, bless God, I ain't putting up with this man I'm married to anymore. I'm out of here. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you'll have some woman who's been letting some guy beat her up and abuse her and abuse her kids for 25 years, and she won't go anywhere. God didn't call you to be beat up and abused and to stand around and let your kids be beat up and abused. That's not what God has for you. And you got to stand up and you got to confront that stuff and say, I'm not going to live like this. I'm not going to be treated like this. I'm not going to let my kids be treated like this. Don't let anybody make you think you're worthless because they mistreat you. 
Don't judge your worth and value by how somebody else treats you. Judge your worth and value by what God has to say about you in His Word. Well, I want to remind you that you do not have to be afraid of anything. Now, you may feel fear, but you don't have to be afraid. They're two different things. We can be bold, courageous, and we can handle anything that comes our way because God has promised that He will never put more on us than what we can bear.